Welcome to K-Drama School. I'm your host, Grace Jung, and class is now in session. credit is co-writing a film entitled Innocent Witness. And the show Extraordinary Attorney Wu stars a beloved K-drama actress who is very young and yet she is a veteran considering her acting career which started since her childhood. Pa Gun Bin, you've seen her in Hello My Twenties seasons one and two. You've also seen her in The King's Affection. She brings such bright, deliberate, and comic acting to her role as this autistic woman named Wu Young Wu. I have a feeling that Pa Gun Bin is going to be winning an award or two for Best Actress uh, for playing this role. She not only brings a delightful charisma to her role, but also a sensitivity and control that demonstrates her masterful acting ability. This show handles a number of marginalized identity politics. It first starts with the earlier generation's female plight. So you have this older woman who is a client to Young Woo, her first client, and she deals with an extremely misogynistic husband who blames her for all of his life's miseries. It later shows a closeted lesbian relationship and a young woman's intention to pursue Buddhism while being disparaged for that choice by her patriarchal kin, thus demonstrating Christian rigidity. It also shows a more severe case of autism and a family that lives in denial of their son's suicide. I feel like that episode was really more a plot on parental denial than it is on autism or suicide. The parents' pressure and expectations on one son to compensate for the illness of the other is really the heart of that episode's issue. And I think this episode coincides somewhat with the Pied Piper episode of the young man Pan Kupong, who lives in delusion by insisting that he is a political savior to young children who are overworked at ed- educational institutions. I feel like these two episodes and the theme of imbalance in a person's life that emphasizes work and career is reflected again in the episode with Chang myung getting diagnosed with stage three stomach cancer. His passion for his job uh, as an attorney left him with the inability to balance his work and personal life, which led to his divorce. Part of what drives a person to overwork is a belief that they'll be left behind or left out. But it's really in this panic mode that people forget they are leaving others behind and thereby isolating themselves even further. You later see a North Korean defector who wants to reclaim custody of her daughter. I don't think North Korean defector stories are explored deeply enough in K-dramas, but there are many North Korean defectors in South Korea who live with a lot of discrimination, and they're subject to uh, some very difficult jobs that a lot of Uh, ethnically non-South Korean people also live with, particularly civilians from China and South Asia. Part of the success of this show, I believe, lies in the narrative structure. It's similar to shows like Hospital Playlist or even a show like Grey's Anatomy, where you have this serialization that is dedicated to each episode with a specific plot line. And given this simple structure, it's easy to follow the story and it weaves in multiple other narratives that showcase a diversity of actors and other stories. I really love how this show explores love and relationship for a person with autism. Many films and shows typically desexualize characters with disabilities, but this show does not do that. The scene when Youngwoo and Juno share their first kiss uh, and when Young asks for instructions in the middle of it, is such an honest, bare, and 
open moment. And it's a very rare scene on any television I've seen. And it demonstrates the strength in telling a story from an autistic character's perspective. From where this show ends, I can definitely see a season two taking place. The show leaves enough doors open and legroom for extended follow through on a number of character storylines. Today, I speak to LA comedian Kristen Cunningham. She produces a show in the Glendale Room. She's a very smart and funny lady. She has an excellent taste of fashion. Let's talk to Kristen Cunningham. Now my mom is like, I miss you. I'm coming into town. I'm just like, okay, I guess you're going to do this thing you've threatened to do my whole life, which is just show up. But <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah. Has she done that before? She hasn't done it before. She's threatened to, but she's just like, um, yeah. She just goes, I bought a plane ticket. I'll be there on the 23rd. And I'm just like, cool. Okay. I, all right. I guess I'll get my life in order for that to happen. <laughs> it's, it's her first time following through on her threat then. Right. I'm just like, oh no, this this cannot go on. <laughs> Goodness. No, my, my mom's done that to me too, but... um yeah it's it's tricky when they when family does that right because it's like well yeah. it's family you know what are you gonna do yeah exactly but at the same time it's like well if i gotta do what i gotta do then i do need to do what i need to do <laughs> <laughs> right it's sometimes it's that's how it is it's just like okay dude but yeah it's a cute cushion i love it thank you it's daiso oh so cute oh my gosh <laughs> I love yeah. it. <laughs> you have very good sense of like color coordination always. I I love just matching slightly, just like just enough. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, even the couch and the cushion, there's like, you know, got that orange kind of tone going, you know, I see it. I see it. I yeah. love this robe. It looks so comfortable. It is comfy. It's a. It's from Gap, actually. If you can believe Stop. it. Stop. That does not look like anything Gap has ever. Made. I know. It's like it's like a it's like a little very it's like it's like a kimono robe. Yeah, and um, that's crazy. Like, I used to throw it over like little dresses and stuff when I went up on oh, stage. Sometimes I would wear it, but yeah, I just throw it on if I'm like you know dressed like shit and I have to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I completely understand. It's too hot to be a person anyway. Today is like, it's like 100 degrees in the valley. And normally I'll try to go for a walk around 7 because it like cools mm -hmm. down around 7. But today it's still 90 something at 7 p.m. Yeah, that's, that's truly trash. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. You're still in K-Town, right? Yeah, I'm still in K-Town, so um, I'm, like, near, like, 8th and Western now. Nice, nice. And you like your mm -hmm. new place? I love my new place. It feels so much bigger than, like, the old place, but it's technically smaller. I don't know how apartment math made that happen. Yeah. But, like, the living room has high ceilings, so it feels so much bigger. Oh, I love that. I love high ceilings. Yeah, my place ceiling is like really, really low. And I have somebody who lives directly above me. I also have neighbors like side to side and all three are very, very noisy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I don't, I, yeah, today's been rough. Like I would just have my headphones on all day. My neighbor has like his kid over and I don't know what it is about like young children, but they have to throw their bodies up against the wall. Like... <laughs> incessantly while screaming off the top of their lungs so i'm like do i have to call somebody like is this child in trouble but no they're literally that's how they're having Just fun having a great time oh a my god time. um what i love about the new apartment is i just heard child screaming in the hallway one day and i'm just like what is happening and it's just a little girl riding her trike having the time of her life in the hallway mm -hmm. just her dad looking like mm -hmm. fucking oh, this is the worst thing <laughs> but she was having a great time and that's the thing that's the thing they're having fun and it's like what are you gonna go out and like yell at them for having fun right. like i don't want to be that bitch you know but also right. it's like shut the fuck up kid you know <laughs> please right. get it together oh <laughs> so noisy 
but you know whatever i was a noisy kid i was so fucking loud as a child you have no idea oh my god i used to get yelled at all the time they would be like please stop <laughs> you know? that is really that's really funny i was no, loud as I hell was, i was a quiet kid because my mom that. was like my mom was one of those moms who's like well as long as you bring a kid at an activity like they'll be fine so my mom right. was like always have your backpack with your crayons and whatever mm-hmm. like that so mm-hmm. see that's smart like your mother was thinking ahead like oh as long as my daughter is occupied with an activity to do then she'll stay calm and focused but see my mother didn't have that foresight you know and I would just be all like fucking bouncing off the wall ADHD shit and she's just like what is wrong with you and it's like actually what's wrong with you I mean <laughs> Maybe you should have brought a book or, you know, a puzzle, <laughs> something. Yeah. That's yeah, really all a kid needs. Right. Just something to make their, because they're going to focus on it for like mm-hmm. hours because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I think girls do. Like I, I was uh, watching, um, I was at like a, like a fa- family, they're like in-laws. Okay. So I went to like an in-law thing mm-hmm. and I was watching boy nephew he's like four years old a boy four-year-old boy would not cannot sit still cannot sit still like every single minute he's moving and breaking something a terror that's so exhausting that's oh my exhausting gosh exhausting to simply live like i just don't know how they do this it's like it, but that's just how like little boys are they're just like yeah. a night a nightmare you know full like yeah. a ball of energy that just can't and then i would and i right next to him were two girls one's seven the other's four they were sitting still just coloring like for hours non-stop yeah quietly coloring and i was just like wow i was like boys and girls are really different and then the little boy's mom was like yes boys and girls are very different (laughs) i love i love a boy mom they're all like (laughs) just ptsd ridden (laughs) just like so strung out slightest trigger (laughs) so strung out viral oh my god like that woman like she like like she would like cry like out of f- over nothing like they like showed her like an album it was like christmas and they gave her an album with like her like wedding photos and she's just like sobbing and i'm like wow like you really <laughs> man that kid you're losing it this is yeah because that little boy like he really was a lot like he was a handful like he just changes his mind like moment by moment but the only thing that is like a crack inducing thing for a little kid I noticed is a screen. Yeah. When that kid wouldn't stop fucking moving around and like driving everybody crazy. And the mother was just like, you know, like about to lose her shit. Um, I just like got my iPad, turned it to the little kid's channel and then I gave it to him and he just, yeah. Like he sat still for a full 20 minutes and that was like well, golden. You, know, you yeah. hacked it. Good job. I mean, it is bad for them, you know, (laughs) like it is bad. They're only going to get it in like 10 years anyway. So it's fine. You know, it's inevitable. Yeah. Let's just rot. (laughs) Let's just rot them ahead. You know, just fucking, I mean, yeah. Break them in. Break them in. It's not like we have a real education system anymore. The way that like that's being dismantled. Why not let them just have that? Let them have something. Let them go. Just let him go, you know. We're all we're see all... what a, a generation of feral children would be. Yeah, like, just, yeah. That, that feels like it could spice things up. You'd make a great principal. Yeah, <laughs> you'd make a great administrator at an <laughs> elementary, like a board member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like yeah, it's like whatever. Just let them do what they want to do. Let's, let the let's ship just sink. See what's yeah, <laughs> let it burn. It's all right can always sow the seeds again it's okay now you grew up in detroit yeah yeah man so detroit and then eventually suburbs of detroit do you know uh who grace lee boggs is no she's like uh she's a civil rights activist who was pretty big in detroit she passed away about six years ago 
uh maybe more maybe like seven years ago but she was like a big fixture in detroit and like back in the i don't know maybe 50s she's so so she's chinese american but Mm -hmm. she uh was a phd student and she was living in like the black neighborhood like in the tenement buildings and Mm -hmm. they were just like so run down like the poorest conditions like rats and like leaks and mold and she was the only chinese tenant in that area everybody else was a black tenant and she was like oh we need to like take collective action and we have to ask for like demand our rights and she started getting into like civil rights movement from that point on and she married um like another activist and like the two of them were yeah yeah pretty active but yeah like uh even till the end of her life she was really committed to uh like detroit's youth and revitalizing that community and uh maintaining like you know like yeah she like prioritized like youth and education and things like that so yeah Yeah, i just she's like the one detroit figure i know figure Maybe I'll mention her. Well, I definitely will look her up after this because I'm curious and also I'm just like, you know, um, that's just, you know, for anyone, especially in Detroit, because it's so segregated, it's such a like segregated area. It's just Mm -hmm. interesting to hear like different people's experiences Mm -hmm. because it's truly just like a segregated like metropolitan area yeah yeah why do you think that is like is, you know it's not just detroit but it's also chicago and you know. um well part of it is like white flight during like the 60s um right before like what they consider like you know the time period of like watts riots and stuff mm-hmm. like that um you know so mm-hmm. civil unrest and that mm-hmm. sort of thing and then the other part of it is like factory jobs leaving um to go further out or just like, you know, eventually being like not in Michigan anymore. So. Right. Right. Yeah. I've never been to Michigan. I don't think not yet, but um, I mean, you Mish is a great school. I know that like a yeah. lot of people go there. My brother's a graduate of um, university of Michigan. Oh, is he in graduate school now? Is that why? Yeah. He's in graduate school. No. Oh, I see. What's he studying? Some sort of physics. I don't know. Every time he says he talks about it, it sounds like I'm talk I listening to an episode of Star Trek and I'm just like, I don't like this and I can't. <laughs> I'm just like, it sounds fake. It sounds fake. I don't know <laughs> if you're saying real things to me. <laughs> so. What did what what did you study when you were in school? Um, I, this is why I jumped, I eventually dropped out of school, but like I started as like international business and then I realized I do not like business Mm because surprise, I don't like capitalism. Yeah. And then I was like, um, oh, I'll do, I like had a philosophy teacher that I really liked and was like, yeah, I'll do philosophy as my other major. And then I was like, so international philosophy what do you do with that besides become a professor and you do not want to teach so quit school (laughs) Mm, wow went that way huh because i yeah i minored in philosophy and at the time i thought i wanted a major in philosophy and i remember asking my ta the same thing i was like what does one do with a philosophy degree she's like well you go to graduate school and i was like what do you do there it's like well you read more and then you do these exams and then you get a doctorate and then you become a PhD. And that's what a PhD is. It's doctor of philosophy. Yeah. So you become an official philosopher. And then I was like, and then what do you do? It's like, you just, you know, become an intellectual. And I was like, and what does that do? And they're like, it's just for yourself. I was like, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that, that was my thing. Um, my philosophy teacher never showed up on time. Um, he was constantly smoking in a way that feels like um, I am actively trying to bring on my death. <laughs> like, he was a really funny guy, really loved him, but it was just like, bruh, uh, if this is the path, I don't want this path. Um, also, I don't 
I don't particularly like academia, so that I knew that wasn't the right thing for me. Yeah, yeah. I really still think you should go to school for fashion because, like, you're really great at it. You have a really excellent sense of fashion. You have a good eye. You dress really well. You're good. You're good at being bold, but also like it makes sense. You're not like bold, like Lady Gaga bold. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you're still integrated in a social <laughs> place, but bold, you know, and mm -hmm. like, and you have a great sense of like shapes as well. And I'm like, yeah, like this could be a thing for her, you know? I mean, I mean is that something you think honestly, about? Honestly, if capitalism was not set up the way it was set up and I would have to quit like, comedy probably to do school i would probably do it but i'm just like i don't see myself actually being able to still do stand-up in a way if i went back to school i don't okay i see what you're saying but also i i was fully committed to my stand-up the whole time i was in school so mm -hmm. i say it's possible like i okay. fr from where i'm standing it's very possible and there are many, many comedians who started when they were in college and they did use college as like a period of, cause there's a lot of downtime when you're a student. That's just a fact, Yeah, you know? And uh, you fill that downtime with standup and there's also breaks like spring break and summer break and winter break. And during those breaks, like I would go on tour and, you know, it's actually kind of a sweet deal when it comes to pursuing stand-up so I mean that was just my experience but yeah no I just like also part of it is like I don't see myself quitting my job to go back to school so I'm just like mm. I would be doing probably like evening like mm. for like a few years so that yeah. would make it hard but oh I see I guess if I quit my job and did school like yeah committed to the bit then mm -mm -mm. Um, I could still have time for it but you know, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. my job will make me quit soon anyway. So we'll see. Yeah. What are you doing now for work? Um, I'm doing like this customer service gig for a furniture company and um Oh, I think you mentioned it. Yeah, currently it's like they're um they're like, you know, the parent company is like in their ear and they're like being really sensitive about everything so like recently i got a warning and i'm just like cool fire me like i'm just like part of me is like fire me and i can live a better life and the other part of me is like the type a in me cannot just like give up so i'm just like i end up i'm ending up doing the same amount of work and i'm just like god damn i'm not gonna get fired because i'm trying too hard right now <laughs> huh okay so you're so you're doing your very very best but at the same time you're hoping to get fired is that the thing yeah it's pretty much that i like can't stop myself right now from doing my best at my job oh. and i wish that i wouldn't but this is also because like i recently started up like adderall and had switched um antidepressants so mm -hmm. i'm less you know less a lot of things so hmm yeah yeah that's a lot it's a lot to handle when the things that um you want to focus on and the things that you're doing are kind of in contradiction with each other yeah 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 mm -hmm. seems to be the case with like a lot of artists that i talk to on this podcast i was talking to like killian mccassie the other week and he was just like raging out about like who, who fucking cares just raging out and I was like, you know, you're saying all these things and you're being critical of the out outside sphere, but I was like, I don't think you realize that you're talking about yourself. <laughs> 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 like he couldn't see that, but that's how it yeah. always is. It's like whenever, like, yeah. for instance, you brought up capitalism twice, you know, it's like, well, I, it's like, I need money in order to live and I wish I had more money, but it's like the rich are always rich and the poor are always poor and that's bullshit and fuck rich people, da da da. But people don't understand that when we criticize the things that we want, those things that we want get further away from us, you know? That is true. 
like uh Killian was like oh like you know I I, I like I wish I had more money and I wish I could sell my art, but I can't. And everybody's a clown and da da da. And I was like, you know, it's, it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's, the like, negative, it's a negative self-talk. You're, you're making yeah. this make sense to me. I'm just like, okay, okay. That's a great point. Yeah. That's and we, we point. all do it to an extent. Like I, mm-hmm. I definitely something that I do and that I'm like consciously and actively trying to not do all the time because it's like oh that no wonder it hasn't been working out like in this area or that area but it makes a lot of sense you know um i was just talking to another friend earlier she's a comedian but she's in berlin and she was just talking about how she like hates her job and she wants to quit but she's like waiting for something to happen and she notices another girl another woman in in her comedy scene who's doing comedy and making a living and she was just like i hate her like talking mad shit about her i hate her and i can't believe she's doing that and she sucks at comedy i don't know that and i was like it sounds like you want her life you know yeah. I was like, it, it sounds like you want to be her and she's like no that's not true i was like i was like you don't like your job you're a comedian you wish you could make money doing comedy she's doing it you hate her you're jealous and you think you think there's something wrong with her but it's like no there's nothing wrong with her you want her life you want her job you just don't want to say it because it's painful but it's like there's nobody stopping her from making that a reality for her it comes with risk it comes with commitment it comes with instability but it also comes with like you got to have trust in yourself you got a firm belief that you are not going to fail at what you're going to pursue comes with like uh, a willingness to go that route you know and clearing all this other shit aside and that is the hard part that is the work it is it, it is like the commitment to it is always going to be like the hard part especially mm-hmm. just like when you're committing to something that you don't really that's truly because it's art it's dependent on other people so like mm-hmm. you're putting your livelihood into like the hands of others Mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily live in a society where um people want to be responsible for other people's livelihoods Mm. so it's really interesting um you know to do art and to try to like survive and live off of that I think it's also like it kind of goes hand in hand with like artists saying, well, capitalism is at fault and an artist is necessarily going to live in poverty. And it's like, well, that's not true because I see no. artists who make a shit ton of money all the time. Lady Gaga being one example. She's, mm-hmm. a, mu- she's a musical artist. She's a right. multimillionaire. You know, and we, we see you and I see it every day in this town. People are pursuing mm-hmm. art like writing or directing or filmmaking or stand up or whatever it is and they make a good living and we see that time and time again of course in our social circles it's mostly open micers and perhaps we don't see as much of that but i do see people like that i was in the mic scene with who are like writer in a writer's room now or you know touring with somebody big or da 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 i'm like i'm seeing that increasingly and it's like oh this is definitely a real thing yeah yeah no that's really great like i mean my thing with stand-up is i um i really feel that it's a choose your own adventure game um and because of that i'm just like well no one's path is going to be my exact same path i can learn from like everyone around me Mm -hmm. and like learn what makes sense to me and what i want to strive for but Mm -hmm. it's it's still like you know we all get caught up from time to time when I was mm-hmm. having the stomach flu, I felt some guy in a way mm-hmm. about someone who got something. And I was like, I don't normally feel any kind of way about this sort of thing. So this is weird and I'm going to explore this. And, what was um, the thing? What was the thing that they got? Um, They just like, they had just gotten like, um, just a show that like is known. And I'm just like, you're not that funny and awesome. they got on like they're a writer or they're an actor or no no it's like um like their own like show platform no a platform stand-up show so like uh, okay but um I'm just so like, it was a stand-up gig yeah it was a stand-up gig and i was just like this is you're not you're not professional how how did you get this and then i was mm. like you gotta 
let this go, acknowledge that you're feeling this way, yeah. and then put in more work into stand up because clearly you felt some kind of way about this. So that means you yeah. need to make an effort. Yes, that's exactly it. Like, that's totally the way. Like, you know, because we are in Hollywood and everybody goes through this period, it's like when you feel uh you know insecure because of somebody else's success like that feeling is like everybody understands it like that jealousy mm -hmm. feeling but um i read this in a book not too long ago um they were basically saying like when you feel jealousy at somebody else's accomplishment try and note what it is that they accomplished in because that jealousy is telling you you want that thing yeah. that means that means that's yours and there's nothing standing in the way of you getting to that and that's what we got to tell ourselves when we feel that way it's like just because this person got this doesn't mean that an opportunity is being taken away from me it just means I know that that's what I want and because I know what yeah. I want I can focus my willpower and intention into getting that because the universe doesn't shrink every time somebody gets something it expands exactly so exactly. yeah i i like that strategy that you just mentioned just kind of be like oh like i'm feeling this way about it let me be mindful of it and let me try and like reassess and how can i redirect my thoughts dig mm -hmm. that yeah because mm -hmm. it was it was so wild because it was like a few people got it and then like some people i was happy for it, and then like this one person specifically i was like what the fuck? <laughs> so it's <was> like <laughs> I was like, this feels petty. I didn't even know that I disliked this person like this. <laughs> like, really? What is it about the person that, that bothered you? You said unprofessional. You said unfunny. Um, not, not unfunny, but just like, I did not feel like the level of funny is like the other people. Oh, and okay. um, also, I'm just like, I the few times that I've seen them just like, has always been like, you know, like for shows, like, um, kind of comes in like doesn't care goes over their time and i'm just like huh. oh these are all the things that you don't do but it doesn't matter and i'm just like it does that's not like you know go be a dickhead like at right. shows and stuff like that that's right. not the solution but i was just like okay just acknowledge that mm. and then keep moving forward in your path and know that this is now something that you see as a goal mm -hmm. and um just make yourself like yeah there's there's one thing that like from a job like my boss said to me and this was like a thing like this corporation would say to people and i love it but i hate obviously that it came from corporate america but it's like be the obvious choice so mm -hmm. like basically i'm just like okay whatever i'm doing whatever i want i need to be the obvious choice like mm. if someone were to select people for it i need to make sure i'm doing whatever I can do to be the obvious choice for it. Interesting. Interesting. And it's also interesting that like you know innately that that is not like you're resistant to that statement because that's just one, like you, like you say, like it's a, it's your choose your own adventure thing, right? In terms of a comedy mm -hmm. career, that's one path being an obvious choice. Yeah. And oh well like when you said that i'm like yeah i could definitely see like several like a handful of people like in our sphere who are the obvious choice in that manner mm -hmm. you know pandering they pander right and they say mm -hmm. conventional things they're very conformist you know i know this one chick like she definitely sells her body like you know like on instagram and on tiktok and she has like like a million followers you know and um it's like yeah she's she's doing something that she knows works and she yeah. has the wherewithal to know that and to go there and mm -hmm. not feel and not feel anything about it. She doesn't care. Yeah. It's no, like, and she, I honestly yeah. kind of really respect people that can do that. I'm yeah. just like, you're like, no, I'm in, I know like this formula, I'm going to make this formula happen. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm just like, stand up for me is a place where I'm one of the places where I'm the least formatic mm -hmm. in my life. And I mm -hmm. don't want to kind of like disrespect that intention. 
and mm-hmm. going into stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, you want to be genuine. You know, you want to mm-hmm. be, you want to be real. You also want to be, f- you want to feel free in being yourself and bold and not restricted. And when these cats who have this, uh, like, be the obvious choice mentality, they're working mm-hmm. in a restrictive manner. Like they have like, oh, this is a category. As you say, it's a formula and they know how to meet those terms and follow through on that and, and be totally okay and thrive. And yeah, that is a strategy. It's like maybe a compartmentalization thing. Maybe it's a rationalization thing. Maybe it's a logic thing, whatever it is. But it's like, you know that that's not you and you have that clarity. And I think that's great. I totally understand that too. It's like, I I can't do that. Fucking hell. Like there were moments where I felt tempted to do that. I was like, maybe I could try this and that. But once I started out, I would notice how much I'm forcing it and I would get rep- pulsed by it and I would stop you know or it just mm-hmm. wouldn't work because it wasn't me you know yeah I, I think there's just no lying to ourselves there's know? definitely no lying to ourselves and then also I think for like you and me particularly we're more conversational so like if it doesn't feel that way it's noticeable somehow mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. people pick up on that mm-hmm. yeah Because, like, we got to feel firm and grounded when we're saying Mm -hmm. our thing. Because it's, like, a definite perspective. And there's, like, a journey to getting to the end of that perspective, right? And if we're not grounded and secure in how we're delivering it, it's, like, it's not going to happen. Like, just yesterday, I was at the improv for the women's mic. And we only Mm -hmm. get three minutes in that. And I'm, yeah. I've been working, and like, when I did your show, I had so much fun. Like, when I did the long, the longer bit about, like, um, IVF and stuff, like, that's, like, a, like, a substantial that's, bit. Yeah, that's a fun joke, too, and I'm excited <laughs> to watch it grow. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, it's, like, fairly new, but it's, like, a substantial joke in that it takes, like, eight minutes minimum to deliver it, mm-hmm. you know? And if I add tags, it'll probably be, like, ten minutes, but there's no way that I could cut it up into a three-minute bit. You know, yeah. Um, there's like another longer joke that I'm working on that's also like minimum six to seven minutes. There's no way I could cut that up and deliver it at, at the at the improv. You know, so like at the improv, I would just do like like a couple of really short one liners and then like a, a, like an old bit. You know, but mm-hmm. you know when I'm delivering my old bit, like people can sense it. They could sense that oh she's like tired of this one. You know. Yeah. Um, and then I close it out with like a newer bit that's like short and sweet and they're like, oh, okay, she's with it. And like, they got it. But um, yeah, like I, I'm sort of cha- I'm sort of sensing that change in my act too lately is like, oh, I really like this long kind of like taking my time, thinking it through, like figuring out where all the tags are. Like if there's any potential mm-hmm. for a tag, let me go and find it, you know, like that kind of thing with one idea and that's been super fun for me and yeah I want to I want to keep doing more of that so that's why I've been like telling people like book me on your shows because like I I need I need 10 minutes to do it minimum I I completely understand like that was like one of the things like moving out here that was really a challenge was like learning to do like things in three minutes because like in Detroit we're spoiled like we're spoiled for time like mm-hmm. there would be times like at open mics where I would just be like, hey, you told me I had five. It's now been like 20 minutes. Would you like me? Like what is happening? And they're yeah. just like, no, keep going. Like you just make it happen. And I was just like, really? I have five minutes. And now wow. I'm just like wow. making it happen, going through stuff and just like having like coming from that and then being like having to go to the clubs and like pare everything down but not yeah. make it sound like forced mm-hmm. and like stuff like that has been challenging but I like the challenge because it just makes me work differently and it just mm-hmm. makes me think about my material in a way that I wasn't thinking about it before so mm-hmm. for sure I do like that yeah it helps you tighten stuff up too you know mm-hmm. sometimes like if we have too much time like both there's advantages to both like if we have too much time then we're so lax that we're not going to be efficient with our words like you know economy of yeah. words kind of thing like that's not going to be a priority if we have 20 minutes to deliver a five minute joke right right? Uh, yeah. But but like, you know, it's like, oh, I only have three minutes or I only have five minutes. Like, I better make it count. 
economy of words it just becomes a priority and you know the joke sounds super sweet super like just to the punchline like da 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 like it's got this rhythm and a focus to it and that is good training in a way um yeah i guess like you know for me like i didn't start out like you know where we had a lot of stage time where it's like you know you got to fight for it maybe when i was in berlin actually berlin like i got a lot of stage time but even there like you know it was more like 10 minutes you know like 20 minutes was rare um but Mm -hmm. yeah like in berlin i got a lot of stage time when i was in chicago i think we talked about this but like i loved chicago it was like amazing I really, I enjoyed going up to Chicago to do shows and mics and stuff like that. Um, a lot of people like advised me when I told them that I was moving. They're like, no, go to Chicago first. And I was like, bitch, you do not understand. I'm not moving for comedy. <laughs> like I'm moving because I want to see the sun and I wanted to live in LA for years. Like I'm yeah. not going to give up because this is where I want to live. Right. But I'm also not going to live somewhere with worse winters like that's the yeah. thing that's the reason I'm moving <laughs> right right no um, I I yeah I totally get it it was cold and rainy when I was there I was there in like March and I'm like it's freezing and it's rainy and kind of miserable but what I loved about that was even though it was rainy and miserable people came out to yeah. watch stand-up like the clubs people were packed out, yeah. packed real audience sitting there in their seats wanting to listen like the crowds mm-hmm. in chicago were so lovable i was like i, really, I, get it. I think that like people really discount midwest like audiences and i think that like midwest audiences are like really they're like really magical because you just like never a know what you're gonna get like you could get like a more liberal crowd you could get like you know um a crowd of veterans and think that it's going to be less liberal and just be like, okay, I'm going to do my jokes anyway. And they're just like, I love this. Like truly yeah. most of the time, like all of the people who love like my material were like old white veterans. And I was yeah. like, I don't understand the trajectory. Like, I don't know how to market to you guys yeah. <laughs> to be like, please follow me and like mm-hmm. be my fan. But it was just mm-hmm. like, it's interesting. And you're just like, you're doing a variety of different walks of life and it's just it's a it's a good place if you want to cut your teeth and you really just want to be like yeah I can do this for anyone yeah 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 and and like build your sense of like self-esteem as a comic too Mm -hmm. I think you know the downside to starting out in LA or New York is like there are so many strong comics that you know we're competing against and you know if we like try stuff out in a like at a mic and the comics are not laughing it feels like fucking shit you know um and it that can take a toll like it is damaging it does like you know fuck up our spirit but going to a place like chicago it's like no you feel so loved and um you feel validated and you know i think those things are important for the artist's ego for sure Mm -hmm. um but yeah, like, it's so interesting that you say, like, these old, like, white male veterans were, like, into your stand-up. And I, like, to me, that's not surprising because when, when, it, when it comes to comedy, it's so subjective. And mm-hmm. that's the thing that could, like, cut through those, like, demographic assumptions that marketers project. Marketers yeah. think, like, oh, since, you know, Kristen is, you know, she's, like, young, black, female, from the midwest that's going to be her demographic it's like no fuck Mm -hmm. no it's 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 going to be all kinds and there's no way for you to tell and like i that's the thing like laugh like laughter like people just Mm -hmm. like to laugh people love comics because they enjoy laughing and they like funny people and humor is just it's hard to really like categorize in that way like you know sam jay sam jay said the same thing she was like I feel like I have this white male Republican in me because so many white male Republicans love me. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. that's not surprising or baffling or shocking in the slightest, you know, like in me, in me, like, I feel like I have like a, like a catty, like gay dude, you know? And I feel like I also have like an old man, you know, I feel like I have like a middle-aged Asian woman, you know, like I have all kinds of, Right? 
Yeah, completely yeah. understand that. And that's like, that's also like for like, especially I think, I think that's one of the things that denotes like comics that are going to be more conversational is the, that they have like these different things that they're like, okay, I need to point, get out this point of view. I need to get this person's point of view out. And it's just like all like, I, I do, I really enjoy that because I'm just like, there's part of me like that I haven't figured out how to make people laugh about this yet. And it's like one of the things that I'm just like, I'm going to spend more time like on the back end of this year trying to like unlock at least one joke to make this happen. But like, I'm like, there's a sorority girl literally in me. And I'm just like, I have to figure out yeah. how to market that because it's like, do that, like be yeah. that person. Yeah. Don't, you don't even need to market it. You just need to tap into it. Right. Like mm -hmm. I took, I took this clown workshop a couple months ago and it was like, you know, like revolutionary for me. Like I, I had never taken like a, like a clown class before, you know, I think yeah, I took no. one acting class when I was in college, but that was it. It was a mm -hmm. drama class. Um, and I've never taken like movement or theater classes ever, but this was like just a two week workshop. And it was so great because they don't let us say words like we have to use our sounds and like motions and that made me not be afraid of using my voice and my face and my bodily movements when i'm on stage it's like oh this is definitely a tool i have and i could use it to make emphasis you know and it was also like a like a like an exploration and finding my inner clown and that's mm -hmm. like such a fun journey because that inner clown is like who you are, like your most authentic yeah. self. And no, um, that sounds fun. Kristen, Kristen Wallace was talking about how she took a clown class and she was oh, yeah? saying pretty much like the same things that you're saying. And just like, yeah. that's really interesting. Like that, um, you know, people are finding that to be helpful. I recommend it. I recommend it. It didn't cost that much either. Like they, they have the LA clown school here. It's mm -hmm. in uh, Eagle Rock and it's taught by David Bridal, who is English. And he's like trained in like English theater, but also like French clown school. And um, he's got like great pedigree. And uh, he was so supportive. And I think I was the only stand up there. I was like very secretive about That's it. Really like interesting. Yeah, I didn't like tell anybody. They were like, "You're very funny." I was like, "Yeah, okay." Like I, w I was like shy about. <laughs> I was like, I love when a stand up is like secretive about being a stand up. I don't know. I'm That's so like shy. One of the that I'm like, yeah. I'm. I'm like, okay, you should tell people that you're a stand-up. Like, that's part really? of the reason. Like, no one is following you. Like, really? you should tell people. So now I get, I, like, one of the things I'm just, like, have been working on for, like, more years is just, like, just let people know. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter their opinion from that point. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think, yeah, I'm so timid about it. Like, especially also when I was, like, in school, like, I would be, I would, ha I would have students and, like, you know, other mm -hmm. peers and in academia, like, you know, I have to be all, like, serious and dry and da-da-da. And I just didn't know how to integrate, like, that humorous, more goofy side into, like, I didn't know how to integrate as, like, one with both of those worlds compromised. No, but... I completely understand. That's part of, like, one of the reasons why I just, like, I, I really am not getting this academia thing. I'm really not getting it. Like, cause I, I would like, um, one of the things that I would do in lectures was like, I would take notes, but I would take them as minutes. And I would mm -hmm. like, you know, sometimes like say, like write out what like somebody said and then write out like my thought about mm -hmm. that. So, um, like I was taking like a political science class and, one of my sorority sisters had said something wild and then was like started talking about filibusters and so like in my notes I was just like Abby talks about filibusters no like just in all caps and then I didn't realize like <laughs> this like this was going on for weeks and then eventually the professor like pulls me aside and he's like hey so like I don't want to tell you to not um take notes the way you're taking notes but people are reading your notes during class as you're taking them so like 
could you move to the back of the classroom? I don't feel great saying that either because you are the only black student in this classroom, but like it is a distraction. And I was just like, oh, how I literally think is a, like not compatible with this. Like it was not just cool. such a wild experience. And I'm just like, and like genuinely like this do new perspective wise like like pers- like how it looked and he's like I like I'm sorry that I have to say this but like it is truly distracting and people are not paying attention and like they were like laughing in class reading it in real time and I'm just like so he's just saying not- you're 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 a class clown that's what he's saying yeah and it was just like I, and to me, I was like, well, I don't, how would I be being in a classroom? No, I'm literally taking notes. Like, I'm not saying anything. I'm just, my, no. my I did, You're I did not know people, notes. I did not know people were being nosy looking at my notes. <laughs> it's literally everybody else's <laughs> problem. Right. It is like not your problem at all. It's his problem. It's those students' problems. And You're, like, but you're being asked to move. Yeah, and it was just like that, like all of my college experience was like things like that. Like um, one of the things like I know now this was like um, like an ADHD thing that I was like, that was helping me focus. So like I would knit during class and that's uh-huh. when I could be very like attentive to like uh-huh. lectures and stuff like uh-huh. that. And I had one professor who was like, yeah, you can't knit in class. Um, and I'm just like, okay, like I... Because, like, I, at the time, I didn't, like, have the language and know, like, hey, like, it's not that big of a deal, like, whatever. Because I was just like, oh, well, like, clearly she thinks this is distracting or whatever. So I put it away. And I'm just like, right. but, like, that's what academia is. It's just, like, being like, there was, no, you can There was not. abuse. Right. So There was, was, like, like educational so. abuse. You almost felt as if you were, like, bullied out of school. Yeah. Just a little bit. A little bit. But, like, also... Part that of that was my fault because I, why did I go to a predominantly white college? Like, why did I do that? I was going to say, I was going to say, I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's because she was black. I'm pretty sure it's because she was black. And it's like, because you, if you're the only black chick in a room, you're mm-hmm. going to stand out. And then if yeah. you're doing something fucking like writing no on your, in your notebook <laughs> in big ass bold letters or knitting, that's going to attract even more attention. And they're going to say like, oh, these are all reasons for me to tell her to move or leave or, Mm -hmm. you know, and those are like aggressive movements, you know, and it is, it is fucked up. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like, and I'm sorry that you went through that shit. Cause when I was in college, there was a, there was a young woman who needed to listen to Tchaikovsky whenever she took exams like he needed to do it and like that's a really cool way to focus and and she told the professors like listen i know this is bonkers but i need to listen to tchaikovsky when i take your exam it's the only way i could do it and she would beg and beg and speak to them beforehand and they would say fine Mm -hmm. so and also like i've taught before and the thing is like you know it's just it's just the professor's decision in that moment they could say yes to anything they could yeah. say yes to anything when they say no to something like that, like as minor as knitting, as minor as taking notes. Yeah. Oh my God, it's them being an asshole. Like I'm telling you right now that that is not your fault. That is their fault. That is their oh, I know, problem. I know 100% it's not my fault. Yeah. I mean, like part of it is part of it, part of it is them being an asshole. And then the other part of it is just like, this person is truly not trained to deal with anything besides Mm -hmm. like the status quo and whatever like they've seen before and like part of me like part of me is I know the difference between malicious and this person is just not prepared for this and doesn't know how to deal with this and I have a little bit more grace for you don't know how to deal with this Mm -hmm. not saying like I have that much grace, but I'm just like, okay, like it's wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. I get why you're wrong rather than. Yeah. Like, That's a really great way to put it. Like you have enough grace so that it doesn't torment you. 
right Mm -hmm. like feeling the rage and the discomfort and the whole like what what a fucking dick it's like you give them enough grace so that you could just like be like okay i get it and i'm not gonna spend my waste my energy hating on them all day you know or or for years at a time and then like honestly i'm just like well that sucks because like if you don't have the tools to fix that you're probably still doing that behavior and you're like doing this to someone else so like yeah about how long ago was this when you were in school oh it's when i dropped out probably when i was 20 so this is a decade ago about a decade ago i'm sure things have changed a lot like when i was when i was training at ucla well it's also ucla it's like you know very progressive liberal school Mm -hmm. but so many things changed things that that didn't exist when I was going to going to college you know there's diversity training there's like you know understanding difference there's ableism training there's uh like even um like you know pronouns like you know going through pronouns in the beginning there's even things like uh if students have like a trigger thing you know like us offering trigger warnings before showing a certain film or sh- like giving some some kind of reading mm-hmm. it's like oh trigger warning like there is sexual assault in this movie or trigger warning there's like animal slaughter in this movie like these things did not exist when i went to school for sure no. so things have improved for sure but yeah. i'm sure that'll also depend on the school and ultimately like i agree with you i'm Uh, even though like I'm a learned person and I have a doctorate and all this like as I was coming out of it like it's like it's as if like I was pooped out of this out of the university it's like poop and it's like I'm I'm the shit you know and I just felt so like irrelevant you know I I just my thing is like that was my experience and I know me and I know that like the next point for me was rage and anger. And that was not something that I was willing to give time and energy to. So I was like, I yeah. need to remove myself from this situation because yes. otherwise I'm going to just be cussing out professors on a regular yeah. basis. And then I'm going to be known as the black girl that cusses out professors on a regular basis. Yeah. So let me not do that. Yeah. Um, but no, I really get it because like, you know, my brother's in like the same position now. It's just like, it's just not like built for that it's like not built for it it's in some ways like academia is literally built for suppressing people of color Mm -hmm. and you're just like trying to get like you're trying to make it through that and you're trying to like of course because this is what we're trying to do um make it easier for whoever is behind you Mm -hmm. and it's just like that's crazy that you're taking on all of that and then like your regular everyday stuff and like your like life trauma on top of it. It's a lot. It's a so lot. I like have a lot of respect for people who like people of color who like finish and like who push through. Thanks. Yeah, like my cohort, it was interesting. We had like two black women. There was one Latino dude. The Latino dude, he passed though. Like he passed for white, and like he, like he, even changed his name. So I was like, all of us, all of us are making fun of you, bro. But anyway, <laughs> no. like for for my two like cohort members, you know, like you know, late thirties, you know, black female, and they both just and they all had they both have children too so they're moms as well single moms and they were just like this is so hard so hard in so many ways and I'm like yeah I know and I was like but please yeah. finish you know because it's like just do it so that you have the degree you don't have to work in this horrible horrible system you know but at mm-hmm. least you have it and you have and you have something that like you intent you set forth for and you have it and it's like, you know, you could be like, I, this is something I achieved, you know, I accomplished, you know, yeah. and it's like, just don't let this horrible, like, the way yeah, things no, are I- get in the way of that. And they're like, yeah, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push through. One of them did drop out, but like, she had a lot of other things. Uh, the other one, she's still like hanging on and I think she's gonna finish next year. So I'm like, so excited for her. Yeah, but it's That's so, exciting. I when you said like it's as if academia is designed to suppress people of color i think that's so interesting because academia like a university system it suppresses any difference like you knitting in class you know you 
taking notes by having an opinion, which is how a person should take notes. They should have an opinion about the things that they read and that they hear. That is how a person takes notes. That's called active listening and active reading yeah. and active writing. And it's like, you know, to, to say no to that and be like, no, do this the other way. But at the same time, academia pretends to be teaching us how to be mm -hmm. critical and to celebrate difference and to fight for the little guy. It's like this pretend bullshit through the paper writing and the way that we train students versus the way that we actually treat students and how we don't let them f like fly their freak flag. It's a yeah. huge contradiction and it, it, it enables confusion in young people mm -hmm. and yeah. like and then, between 18 and 25 they're the most mental breakdowns in right. america and then also it's just like you leave the system and then you have to unlearn all of this because most of it does not exist in the real world so mm -hmm. then you're like in a period of unlearning all of the the like you know reprogramming that you received mm -hmm. and like I'm not, I really, I don't want people to think I'm anti-academia. I'm just mm -hmm. like, go in, eyes wide open, know that mm -hmm. like, that's what it is. Cause I, it's yes. definitely super helpful for people. And like, yeah. you get access to things that you would not get access to otherwise. And you're taught to like, learn and like, dig for different things. And then you create networks and those networks will tell you different things. Yeah. So like, it's great in like that way, but it's just like, there's a lot of ways that like, now as I'm older, I'm just like, wow, like, I can't believe that like, I, I taught myself to stop doing this thing. And now I wish that I could do that thing now, but I don't remember how to do it anymore. So like right. that notes thing, I cannot take notes like that anymore. I truly can't do it. And I'm mm. like not good at notes anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just like, mm -hmm. there's certain stuff that it's just like, you know, you have to push through and then you have to relearn it. And just, you know, all of life is relearning whatever like hurts you. So it's yeah. not anything different than connecting with your inner child, but it's just like connecting with your, um, I guess, inner ignorant person. Like, I don't know. I think that makes sense. Like it's, well, it's connecting with your inner child and it's also, it's having grace for the inner ignorant person. So maybe the having grace or having understanding or love for the inner person that I find insufficient and to mm -hmm. say to her, actually, you're not a problem you know like i fully embrace you and you know you are you are sufficient like sort of saying that actively and you say that you can't take notes the way you used to anymore and i disagree you take those notes every day all the time but you just take it to the stage do you not see yeah, that that's that you're right it is it's just yeah. like it's verbal now it you're is 100 right it's verbal now you're 100 percent what it is still reactive man you're still reacting to what you see as nonsense or bullshit or crazy or hilarious and you just talk about it just like you were when you were reading you know dry ass academic shit but you're you know it's like you got more agency in it because now it's like you know whatever you want to put your attention to you have a choice in it and then you can you also have a choice in how you're going to go and deliver it on stage, you know? That is 100% right. That's a great way to look at that. I'm glad you said that because now, yeah. now I won't feel as bad to be like, you edit so much on stage. You need to like write more. And now it's just like, no. Oh man. <laughs> like that's a really good perspective for that. So yeah. You. It's just, you're just, it's just naturally in you. Like when, when you were like, oh, he's like, you know, the professor is like noticing this and the kids are laughing. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're just, you were just being a comedian, like from college, you know, but like silently yeah. in class, like. Yeah. And, and I totally, and at that point, totally like, cause like I grew up in a like very strict household. My mom didn't like really let me watch anything. Like I, she was like very textbook. So like you're, you're 13 so you can now watch pg-13 movies mm. like i wasn't like allowed to like listen to the radio really so like wow. just like strict like that sure um so i like 
I knew comics, but I knew comics from like the sanitized sitcom version. Of sure. Them. So like I knew like your Chris Rock, your Bernie Max, yeah, like, your Mar- your Martin Lawrence from like uh-huh. their sitcom versions of them, yeah. which is much san- more sanitized version. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I knew that it was sanitized. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm not that. So like I didn't like I never like comedian was never a thing uh-huh. um, that I even thought about. And then honestly, um. The, the only reason why I got into comedy was like I had a sorority sister who was like a major comedy fan like and she was like obsessed with like you know Reggie Watts and like mm-hmm. Pete Holmes and like that mm-hmm. when they were coming up yeah. and um, she was like no you're really funny and I was yeah. just like no that like you're and she was like a very like nice person and I was like oh no that's just her being nice and she's like no, you're really funny. And then eventually, like, I went on to, like, listen to their podcast. And I was like, oh, this is how I talk. This is what she was talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 She's right. You are funny. That time when I, like, made that chocolate delivery to you at your house, I was just like, fucking, you know, like, you would just say stuff. And I'm like, that's a bit. That's a bit. You know, like, I remember that. And I'm like, yeah, you, you know, your your language is just naturally a comedian's language. And uh, I, I feel like maybe that was the one, like, huge silver lining to your college experience is like, yeah, you were in a sorority at an all white girl, I mean, all white school, but mm-hmm. your sorority sister did sort of help you connect your identity to this thing, this gift that you have, which was poo pooed in the classroom but yeah when you're with your sorority sisters it's like this is amazing like we love being around you and it's like yeah. now you're a stand-up in LA so you know it's like I see the arc man I see the arc in your life <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it, it it definitely like I I am honestly very grateful for that time I learned so much and also just like I um did not grow up in a predominantly white area because that's Mm -hmm. the segregation of Detroit like I grew up in like black areas with like yeah people like yeah if I saw like someone different like we're it we're talking like some sort of Asian Middle Mm -hmm. Eastern that's Mm -hmm. about as different as we're getting like we have like one or two token white people in our school so I'm just like that was just not my experience right. so it was really good to get a different perspective mm-hmm. and to learn how much like I'm just like oh okay this is insane to me and yeah. also just like also just okay that's a different way to think of this and it's interesting to learn that people are moving this way in the world because that's not how I've seen people move in the world so yeah it was our- yeah it was a good experience. I learned what I needed to learn there and I made yes. the relationships that I needed to make there. Exactly. Exactly. And even like, I don't know why, but I'm just like, so, so, I'm so stuck on this. You know, like a friend of mine, I think I said this to you when we we're in the green room at your show, but like a friend of mine, she's just an actress. She's an improv actor. She's an improv comic and she's an actress and she's like a working actress in Hollywood right now. But she was called on to a indie film production as a wardrobe person because she's just really good at dressing down and dressing up. She's like, she has style you know Mm -hmm. and she knows clothes she knows color like she's good at it and I'm just like fucking I wish Kristen would do this you know like that's no that is that is something that like I am actually trying to do so like I have a friend who um does a lot of PA stuff and every once in a while like when like things will work out and she hears of like a job she does try to like um suggest me and like let me know when it's happening and like um so I did get to PA on like a Super Bowl commercial of all things as like my nice. first PA job. That's a sweet and gig. Yeah. It was pretty great. And like, and, and I even got to do like a little bit of stuff with like wardrobe. So it was yeah. like cool. But no, that was one of the, that's one of the things that I do want to put more time and effort into yeah. Um, yeah. is like wardrobe cycling. I think that's yes. really fun super fun and like you don't need a degree for that you just need the experience you know you just need like the contacts and like that I'm like excited for you in that path because you know like 
I know you've been working like doing the customer service thing and like a job's a job, right? But it's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that way. A job can be a job you love and that like makes you feel like this is, this is the thing for me, you know, like, yeah, and, and that's why we're here. That's why we're in LA, you know, so. 100%. But it's just like, you know, with like the pandemic and then also have moving out, like being so like, without a job so long and then especially right after I first moved out here I was like no yeah. I just need stability for a little sure bit. And yes like, now I'm just like well I think I'm done with stability uh-huh so, yeah time to I get all I'm reckless done. now yeah <laughs> time to get time to get do the fun shit you know yeah I'm like yeah. I'm, I'm rounding that corner good I'm I'm happy to hear that Fuck yeah. Okay, I do this at the end of all of my podcast episodes, but um, I just basically ask my guest questions about a show and you just answer like, what would you do if you were this person in this scenario, okay? Um, so it's like improvising. Great. Yeah, all right, so this is a brand new show. Actually, it's probably gonna end, I think it's gonna end next week, but it's on Netflix. It's called Extraordinary Attorney Woo. And it is about a... 27 year old attorney she is autistic and she's the first autistic uh lawyer to ever get hired at a major firm in korea so it's like a big deal right that's cool so she let's say let's say you are her boss okay you're her boss you're her mentor you're the senior attorney your, your attorney jung is your name and uh, you get a file to your desk saying that there is an autistic person who is coming into your firm, but you have never dealt with an autistic person before. You, you also know that she came in late, like, you know, all the other young attorneys who just came in as trainees, like they've already finished their orientation, all of this. And she just, it seems a little bit like nepotism. So it's like, yeah, you, you're conflicted in terms of the moral and ethics of the nepotism part, but it's also like, she's a person with a disability and you're not familiar with how to deal with that. And there are questions like, oh, are you going to hire this person or not? Because this, this, the decision is ultimately up to you. What do you do? I feel like as a lawyer, it's my responsibility to dig deeper and figure out what's going on um, there. So like the first step would be to obviously like research autism and like mm -hmm. find out some pretty basic things about it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then from that perspective, learn about what are like, you know, some things that would be challenges or whatever yeah. and like way what the challenges are versus my experience and what I think that I could give as mentorship. Mm. And then from there, decide whether or not um, I'm really going to be the person who's like, uh, I'm going to put up a battle against nepotism. Like I would decide like if that was worth my time and energy, mm. probably it would not be if I'm being 100% honest, because I'm, I, I feel if I'm a lawyer at a major firm, I'm tired. I'm just trying to get my check. I have yes. other files to get to. Uh -huh. Just let this nepotism kid in. I'll just figure out like how yeah. I can not like ruin them. And yeah. like, you know, cause also legally I have to figure out how to not ruin them. There's a lot of reasons why I should just learn about autism in this. Case. It's true. It's true. Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay. Let's say you're, um, you're this, so this girl, her name's a girl. She's a woman. Her name's a Wu Young Wu, and she got hired. Okay, she's hired mm -hmm. now. She's an official, like you know, junior attorney at this firm. Okay, and it's a very prestigious firm. All right, let's say you're her male colleague. You're also a brand new attorney there. Your name is Kwon Minu, and you are super competitive. All right. Like you graduated top university. I mean, so did everybody there, but mm -hmm. you're very cutthroat. You know that this is a one year contract and they're going to do like a, like end of the year, kind of like review to see which of the attorneys they're going to hire permanently and who they're going to let go. And you see this autistic woman just like winning cases, getting everybody sympathy. You can't stand the sight. Right. You want to take her down. So every time she fucks up, you go and like tattle on her to your boss. And then your boss reprimands you. He's just like, why are you so like, 
you know, bent out of shape about her, you know, but the way you feel is like the system is rigged for her to, Mm -hmm. to accommodate her disability, but now you're being reprimanded. What do you do? Um, so I guess my first question is, is my goal just to like, um, make sure that I get hired at the end of the year? Yeah. Then I shut the fuck up and get (laughs) hired at the end of the year. What are we talking? I'm just going to let this woman let me not secure the bag. I'm securing the bag. It's like, I'm sorry, let's be besties until like the year is up. And then I'm like washing enemy for life. And it's good. We're good. Yeah. Why would I fuck up the bag? Exactly. Right. (laughs) Exactly. I'm totally in agreement with you. Okay. All right. Let's say uh, your 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 uh, Wu Young was good friend. You're a friend of hers. You guys went to college together. Okay, your name is Suyun, and you're also an attorney. Now there's a hot guy at your firm. Okay, he's not a he's not a lawyer. He's just part of like the legal team, like an administrator. Okay, his name is Junho. He's a hottie. All the chicks dig him. Think he's so fine. Okay, somebody says to you that he likes you. And you're kind of like interested, you know, you're kind of eyeing him differently and, you know, you're flirting with him a little bit at the office. But one day you realize that Junho is really nice to your friend, Youngwoo, the autistic chick. Like he seems very attentive to her, very caring. You can tell that he actually likes her, not you. You were misinformed, feeling kind of petty, jealous feelings. What do you do? Okay, that's hard. Um, because I, <laughs> my instinct always is be petty, but like also I'm just like that's your friend, and like that's that's my line for pettiness. I'm like, well, you're not gonna be petty to your friend because you have to be a person. There's rules, and um, yeah. so so I guess I don't know. Like, part of me is like, it's not my business. Just let them like do what they're doing. They'll figure yeah. it out. And if they don't figure it out, then like maybe in my shot can be shot. So uh-huh. yeah. uh, like, I'll just root for me, you know, I'll root for me from the sidelines. It's cool. Like if she fumbles the bag, I'm here. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, all right. Let's say you are the, uh, autistic attorney, young Wu. You like this guy, Chunho. You've never liked somebody before, ever. Okay. Never liked anybody. And as an autistic person, like things like physical touch is very uh, tricky. Like, you know, like it's just like, it's not like a personal thing. It's just like your body physically just can't withstand touch for too long. And um, like he, he's very careful around you, you know, and you, the two, and you want this. So, like, you like each other and you guys do initiate a first kiss. Okay. You've never smooched a guy before, but you don't really know how to kiss somebody, but the moment's happening, but you're, you're not sure like how to, how to, how does a kissing thing work? What do you do? I just let this play out. Like, I'm just like, if, if he's not feeling this, like, I'm just going to assume like he's going to tell me and we can correct it from there. Um, Okay. I'll just be in the moment because anything else feels like it will end in calamity. Like I'm not trying to like fall down a staircase because I Mm -hmm. like ran away or something. So Mm -hmm. I'm just like, let's, let's just see where this goes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Run away. That's good. Okay. Cause that leads me to my next question. Let's say now you're a Chunho. You're the hottie, the, the, Mm -hmm. the guy, the love interest. Okay. Let's say you and Youngwoo are together alone late at night at the office and she asks you, like she says to you that she likes you and she asks you like, do you like me back? And you say like, well, yeah, you know, and you're kind of approaching her like closely, like to stand more closely next to her. And, uh, Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Did I say you're Chunho? Yeah, you're Chunho. I'm sorry. She, Mm -hmm. so you're with her and you stand more closely next to her. But as soon as you get closer, she runs away. Like she's like gone, like fucking bolted out the door. What do you do? Okay. Um, so this, this answer is informed by, um, like 
two decades worth of fan fiction reading. Um, <laughs> okay. I just, <laughs> I just let this happen. I'm just like, whatever. Like, I know that, like, there's touch issues. She'll she'll figure this out. We'll regroup. We'll read uh-huh. meet about this. It sucks yeah. because, like, you know, I had this, like, ambiance seduction was happening. But, like, uh-huh. I guess I'll have to redo this. I yeah. knew what I signed up for when I, you yeah. know, started making the moves on. The uh-huh. Moment, so. uh-huh. Wow. Two decades, huh? <laughs> <laughs> long so embarrassing long but like, what was awesome. what was the fan fiction like what was the fiction that you were a fan of um it started off with Yu-Gi-Oh so like okay got it gotcha you know, you know, gotcha it, it's not great Good. not great um no I'm it's amazing it's not Yu-Gi-Oh anymore <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that that left it's been many decades since that <laughs> that's dope I love it um okay all right, let's say you're Chunho again, all right? You're the guy, you're the hottie. You and young are walking together on the street. And a college friend of yours, a woman, walks up to you in the street. And she's like, oh, my God, like, it's been so long. How are you? And then she looks at young who, you know, she's autistic, so her hands are, like, up here. And she's, like, not making eye contact, kind of looking around. And she says to you, oh, are you still doing volunteer work at the disability center? What do you do? Damn. Um, first of all, I feel like my grift is up. <laughs> I feel like that just revealed <laughs> that this man is into autistic women and he was using <laughs> the volunteer site <laughs> as a dating ground pre- previously. So I'm just like, hopefully uh, she's not, she is not connecting dots. Um, uh god yeah. i would just be like why would you say that i think that would just be the only response is like no nah, i'm gonna put the blame back on you because i didn't i didn't come out brazy uh-huh. to someone i haven't seen in a while i yeah. there was like no hello how are you doing it's just like oh you're still doing volunteer work that's crazy like yeah that's crazy yeah yeah no it's rough all right all right this is a juicy ass show okay um it's now we're gonna get to the real juicy stuff okay so you're young right you're the autistic woman you were raised by a single father and your father told you when you were young that your mother died and you didn't really know anything about your mom but you also have this childhood memory of your grandmother getting drunk one night and saying to you that your mother actually gave birth to you and then abandoned you and then ruined uh your father's life so you always knew that your mom was still alive time has passed and there's a huge law firm that is a competitor to your law firm where you're working at and the ceo of that law firm turns out this wealthy wealthy woman Turns out she is your mother. What had happened was she got pregnant when she was in law school. Your father was also a law school student, got pregnant, wanted to abort. He said, please give birth, that he will raise the baby. So she stayed at home for a full year, pretending that she was living abroad, gave birth in secret, and then sent the child to your father. And he raised you on his own with the promise that he will never like appear in in front of her or never come to her or anything like that right so that's what happened and uh you meet your mother for the first time and she's asking you like she actually she doesn't know that you know that she's your mom she's asking you she's like oh you're a really great attorney will you come and work for my firm like i'll take good care of you and this is a re- she this is actually a more prestigious firm than the one that you're already at in fact this is number one the firm that you're at is number two what do you do Man, okay, this is difficult because, um, well, like, is the, where is, is the prestigious firm still, like, in the same city? Like, are we still in the same zip code? I don't want to, um, mess up my hobby situation. Same, Um, same city. Same city. Okay. So, like, that's that. Um, (laughs) the hobby situation. I mean. It's important. 
to me, it makes more sense to go over there because then, like, the hottie situation is not, like, a workplace romance that could, like, you oh. know, be, like, an HR situation. Um, oh. She doesn't have to know that I know. I can just be messy. And then also that's Ooh. just, like, you know, me sneaking in the backdoor nepotism. If anything, like, goes down weird at that firm, I just go, um, this bitch is my mom. <laughs> and, <laughs> and wow. Wow. And then she has, like, a whole set of fires she has to put out. So, like, this feels like, to me, like, the wow. best course of action is to go work for them. Because, like, just, you know, just separate yourself stuff Damn. yourself from the situation. And I feel like if you're autistic, you would be good at that. So do it. <laughs> Jesus, man, you are political. <laughs> Scandal political. I love it. Okay, shit. Okay. All right, final question. Let's say you're Young Woo's dad, single father, right? Like after you you know, after Young Woo came into your life as an infant and you knew that you had to be a single father responsible for this baby, you quit you quit law school. You quit law school. You decided never to pursue law just so that you could respect your ex-girlfriend's wishes, the promise that you will never appear in front of her, right? If you continued to be an attorney, then you would have kind of been in the same circle as her. And you just gave up your dreams of being a lawyer, became a single dad. You started working as a small business owner, a very small restaurant, okay? And, you know, you're trying to be the best dad. Now, your ex-girlfriend, she shows up. Okay, and she brings a pamphlet and says she has another firm based in Boston. And she's saying to you, tell your daughter to move to Boston and she can be an international lawyer at my firm in Boston, which is a very prestigious place. The reason why she's saying this to you is because she's about to run for a political office position. And she doesn't want this, you know, like you know child born First out of wedlock. Of all, I love that I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I knew the vibes. Okay, I like that. Um, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, but what like, well, that? yeah. And, and she says, like, you know, just do this. Do this for me because you actually broke your promise. Like you and your daughter are in front of my gaze. Like, why are you doing that? She says, is it because you want money from me? And she's being like, kind of a bitch. Yeah, what do you do? Like, first of all, this transaction was between you and I. You didn't say anything about this baby. This baby is her whole own entity. And as a lawyer, you should know that. You should know that contracts don't apply to babies. So mm. she's going to do whatever she wants to do. I'm not going to tell this child to do that. And if mm-hmm. you, it would behoove you to make a situation, you know, you do whatever, mm-hmm. like clean up whatever you have to do on your own. Um if you want someone to go to Boston, I'll go to Boston because you fucked me up. So like you figured out like I the I, I don't work for you for free. Like, I'm sorry. Um, also, ethically, you're trash. Why would I make things easier for you? Go be blessed away from me. Yeah. Farewell. Um, and also, I think I would say um, please never haunt like the doors of my restaurant again you are not uh-huh. allowed in this eatery for the uh-huh. rest of your life you're banned um so i think that yeah. would be the energy nice yeah <laughs> yeah papa bear you know like what the fuck yeah yeah no i love it love the answers thank you this is a super fun uh fun no, chat thank you yeah. because i will watch the show now because i am fucking vested <laughs> it's a good show i it love wild. this show it like so wild. many so many friends i have a friend in israel like in fucking tel aviv israel she like <laughs> sent me a voice message yesterday she's like grace there's this show i really want to talk to you about called attorney woo or something and i have so many questions can i please <laughs> talk to you about it can we set up a phone call and i was like yeah anytime, nah, anytime. i'm gonna i'm definitely gonna watch this because i'm just it's like a great show First of all, I haven't used my Netflix subscription the way that it, it should be used really? to, like, how much. I just, like, I haven't been, like, I've been really, I've been in a little anime, like, binge uh-huh. lately. Uh-huh. So I just yeah. have been, like, Crunchyroll is really where it's at for me. Yeah. Like, I've run out of anime, so I'm just like, yeah, I guess yeah. 
I'll have to switch back to like regular people. And, there, there is like, a lot of good K dramas that are based on like webtoons and stuff that have like an mm-hmm. anime feel. So if you want recommendations, I could send you a list over text. It's no problem at all. Yeah, yeah. I will take recommendations. I will take yeah. recommendations. Yeah, love it, love it. All right, thanks, Kristen. This was so fun. Thank you.